Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur. My name is Sean Walchef, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. In life, in the restaurant business, we learn through lessons and stories. We're so grateful for Toast, our primary technology partner at our barbecue restaurant. So many of the guests that have been on this show use that technology, but more importantly, they believe in what we believe in and that there is a creator economy that is happening right now, right all around us. And as hospitality of professionals, we need to embrace the tools that are at our fingertips. Today, I have a very special guest, David Zhao. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sean. It's amazing that you're setting this up. and I'm very excited to be on the show. So $100 million restaurant brand, you've got a restaurant empire, and you're on the Forbes 30 under 30. How did that happen? Uh Overnight, uh, just, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but <laughs> it's been it's been ten years in the making. So we started this around with my partner, 2013. After I graduated from high school, took a few years off from college to build the first location. Um, that location was just a million and a half uh, for the build out and everything, and it's still in Vegas right now. That's our first location called Chubby Cattle. And nine years later, we just went. You know, we figured out the game of hospitality and food and beverage. It took a lot of time and went through a lot of obstacles and yeah, nine years later, we're here at 10 locations. Yeah. 10 locations. That's absolutely incredible. So, you know, my favorite question, my favorite random question to open the show is where in the world is your favorite stadium stage or venue? We're in the world. Um, to be frank, I think it's really cool to be at all different States. So a lot of restaurant groups like expand within New York or within LA, but for us, we actually expand across the country, which is a little different. Um, and because of just how a, a joint venture partner want us to go into different city or different state, and we ended up starting in Vegas, which is like one of the, I would say capital of like food and beverage, right? Uh, and nightlife. And then we opened up in Denver, which is like mid, mid America. Uh, we also had opportunity to open in Pennsylvania where I went to school when I opened up with my college friends and our holding uh, restaurant group. Then we opened up in LA. So, and then Chicago. So we've been to different venues and I think it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to be in these different cities and get a taste of how the different demographics are accustomed to our concepts. So I need you to pick a stadium for me, your favorite stadium in the world okay favorite stadium oh, it's got to be Allegiant, i guess in uh in okay. vegas <laughs> perfect so now we there we go so now we're at Allegiant stadium and what we like to do is anybody that listens to this show we like to think that you only listen to a podcast you only watch a show if you want to level up you're playing the game within the game so we're going to go to Allegiant stadium i'm going to convince entrepreneur toast a bunch of other partners to come and put on literally a ted type talk hospitality conference. And I'm going to put you on the 50 yard line. I'm going to say, David, it's your time. I need two minutes for you to mic drop this entire stadium and let them know who is David and what's David building. Oh, amazing. I love how you put that. Uh, yeah, we're at Chubby Cattle. Uh, what we're aiming to do is to bring the world closer together through our food brand. 10 years ago, when we started, nobody understands a lot of the Asian modern contemporary Asian concepts that we've curated uh, 10 years later we're seeing landlords from across the country inviting us and bringing us uh to their amazing uh properties so it's it's been an honor to be able to bring our concept to bring my culture to the west and bring people closer together through food and yeah and i hope to do that for the next 10 years for the next 10 years so you know this is going to live on entrepreneur.com forever and what i also like to do is tell me what the next 10 to 20 years looks like. Because when you first started, you weren't in restaurants, right? Right, right. So it's interesting that when I first started, I actually was in the uh, restaurant marketing side. So I was a freelancer for a lot of Asian restaurant owners. And I basically went up what to- year, what, Give me a context, what year? Yeah, this is straight out of high school. I was trying to make money for college tuition. And what I did during high school. What, and during what my year? What years, year are we talking about? 2013. 2013. So this is when Yelp was just coming out and yep. everyone's using Yelp. Uh, and I would go to these Chinese restaurant owners and hot pot shops and be like, hey, I, I will set up your Yelp. I'll set up your Instagram, Facebook page, Google My Business and your website and also manage it per month, making sure that you can attract customers outside of your walk-in traffic, right? At the time, walk-in traffic was everything. Yep. And 
now it's completely different. People can find hole in the wall spaces through Yelp, through Instagram, and people going from TikTok. So we leveraged that way in the beginning. And that's what I did during my gap years and how I met my current partner, which is uh, Harvey. And uh, he was a client of mine. And we're like, hey, uh, I've been doing your marketing for you know a year now. Uh, why don't you be our CMO and invest in our next hot pot chain? hot pot restaurant in Vegas. And I had no idea how to operate a restaurant, no food and beverage background. I was just good at getting people in the door for these Chinese restaurant owners who didn't even speak English uh, to get non-Asian customers into their store via Yelp and social media. So that's what I did yep. during my gap years and got into the restaurant space around 2013. Yeah. So when you're in, in 2013, I think it's fascinating because I'm here 2022, we're going into 2023, we're putting on multiple shows, multiple shows for entrepreneur, we have a show called Digital Hospitality. So much of what I do when I go and I speak is I talk to restaurant owners about what we call digital hospitality, understanding that there's something that we do as restaurant owners in real life that's magical. Making magical moments is really what the whole world, every business should strive to do. That's how, we, how someone makes you feel is that that magical moment. But the problem is that now magical moments need to be extended omni-channel on all these different platforms. Now, what you're doing in 2013, those are the same things that because we opened up our restaurant in 2008, first iPhone comes out in 2007, 2008 was so long ago that all of these tools were all new. But even in 2023, when you're starting this ad agency, you're having these conversations. Can you believe that we're in 2022 and people still don't think that they need to care about Yelp, that they need to care about Google My Business, that they need to care about TikTok, that they need to care about Instagram? What would you say to restaurant owners today when you go out and you speak? Yeah, I, I think there's a huge transformation, right? Our ad agency is still in New York and we work with some of the top brands, especially of Asian contemporary cuisines. And it's absolutely essential. It it's, should be a part of the operating budget and operating strategy for any restaurant to make sure that you have. And marketing is not, is not just about getting the customer in the door. There are many stages of the funnel uh, from customer acquisition, from building your brand to customer retention, how to make sure your customer loyalty is there. So when you think of marketing for the restaurant, you want to think about all of those things and how you interact with your operating team to make sure that you improve your experience via feedback. You're making sure you're increasing your customer customer lifetime value by inviting them back, setting loyalty program. And there's so much cool software in the space that's being developed. Uh, for example, Toast has a great, we utilize Toast at a lot of our restaurant locations. Awesome. And they have a lot of plugins uh, that you can utilize. And, and from inventory side to customer acquisition to customer retention, uh, th that's very crucial for a restaurant's uh, profitability and for a restaurant's survival. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to welcome our newest sponsor to the show, and that is Davo Sales Tax. Davo is an incredible company. I remember when we first opened up our restaurant in 2008, Cali Barbecue, we were struggling to figure out how to automate sales tax, how to have enough money in our account to file our quarterly taxes. I am so grateful that now, today, we have found Davo and they are a sponsor of the show and they are excited to help other business owners no longer have to become tax collectors. Davo does it all for you. They take care of the compliance, they take care of the collecting, they take care of the filing. Get your first month free by going to davosalestax.com slash influencers. Let them know that we sent you. Davo is an incredible company. We're grateful to have them on the show. They integrate with all the top POS companies, including Toast, davosalestax.com slash influencers automate your sales tax today and get back to running your business so bring me back to the crazy idea why why restaurants why you know <laughs> so yeah. many things you could have done you saw you saw all the failures how difficult it was to try to get money i, I mean what you offer as an ad agency as a digital marketing firm is so valuable it's so critical yet restaurant owners find it hard to invest on things that are important for them to grow their business. When you start to understand the profit and loss side of running a restaurant, what made you crazy enough to want to get into this game? Yeah, well, I was young. I was 20 years old, uh, 19 <laughs> when I got into it. I uh, had no experience. I put my life saving of $40,000 uh, into the first restaurant, my partner. We didn't make money for two, three years. I'm Where was this all located? Hours. This is Vegas Chubby Cattle. So okay. now it's like a local's favorite spot to go to. 
Uh, and this is before the X Pow, which is fine dining. And yeah, I, I had no idea. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, to be, to be frank. And I think a lot of people get into the restaurant for the first time, like, hey, I think I have a great idea. I think the food concept is good, and they get in. I just made a video on Instagram about how 90% of restaurants fail within the first few years. Yep. And it's because people think when you create a restaurant, it's all about creating good food, right? You have good food and you like this taste and that's it. But really, because the restaurant has a pretty low barrier to entry versus some other businesses, you have to be an expert actually in like construction in yes. lease acquisition and finance and debt raising your capital costs and making sure your front of house staff is amazing uh, payroll management and, you know, food cost management. If you have a vertical integration of food costs, you have to be an expert logistics and how to make sure your food gets to the right places. Uh, and marketing, of course, and operations. Yes. It's just, you have to be an expert in all of these aspects in order to have an edge uh, in the restaurant space to be profitable and to be scalable. So that's something that I've learned across, like through time by not giving up and pivoting and continue because we could we could have given up during COVID. We could have given up the first three years when we didn't make any money. Uh, but my partner and I stick through it. Uh, some investors, we ended up buying out. We ended up uh, during COVID, people didn't want to put more capital to our new project, but we ended up having to like sell our homes to to make sure that we open up. So there's a lot of story in that in itself. But yeah, I, I did choose the restaurant. Uh, like when I just put 40 grand into, it, I thought it's going to be a very passive investment, like a real estate rental property or something. And my, op my partners will operate, but ended up being, and it's a blessing in disguise that we ended up learning. I, I got to learn a lot about the restaurant space through operating it, uh, and growing it, uh, for the past 10 years. Yeah. Bring me back to the darkest hours. Cause those are the things that, you know, the reason why I started our first podcast in 2017 was, um, you know, we called it behind the smoke and we're in a barbecue business. Uh, we wanted to talk about the failures. I went to business school in Colorado and I remember sitting there going, this guy's full of shit. Like this guy doesn't ever own a business. And I remember not, you know, not continuing on in business schools to actually changing my major to sociology. And I think as business leaders, it's easy to go to your website. It's easy to go to your IG. It's easy to go see, you know, chubby cattle and expat at, you know, at the Venetian, all these sexy restaurants, this empire that you're building and go, Oh shit, this is easy as hell. There's no dark days. Bring me back yeah. to the dark days. Yeah. I think like we have to, as entrepreneurs in all uh, verticals, we need to share more about the journey. It's not just, you see at the, you know, now you go on our Instagram or see Yelp and like, this is a, you know, top rate of press. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Darkest days. Let's just talk about COVID. And I think during COVID, all the restaurants have to shut down. I've never gone through something like that. And we had three restaurants pending construction, uh, couldn't open, but we still had to pay rent and we don't get any of the benefits of the PPP loans because we have no employees for those new locations, which means that we had to come up with pay all the costs, continue fixed costs, uh, but we couldn't open all the casinos in Vegas were closed. And uh, my partner, I have to decide like, hey, we're, you know, I don't know. I don't know when this winter will end. And no, no investors wanted to put up extra capital for many of the projects. Uh, but thankfully, we found some investors that's like, hey, we understand what you guys are going through. Here's a loan. Here's some more equity inje injection. Uh, and my partner and I have to decide, like, all right, we're going to sell our home, sell our cars, come up with the capital for the expat, which is in Venetian now, to make sure that this project uh, sees its day. Like, it wasn't even open so yet. So you sold and your home and your cars? Yeah, yeah. At the time, yeah, we sold our home. I sold my home in New York. Uh, and my partner sold his homes in, in Los Angeles to make sure that we fund this. Um, what did, your, fam what did through. your family say to you? Oh, I mean, uh, well, my family trusted me at a young age because I started making money young uh, through freelancing and everything. So it was just my decision. Uh, but it's, it's, I think one thing that's key is also to our success is that my partner and I have the same vision. Like we're willing to sell everything right now. If it's a new project, if the company needs it and we need it, we would, we would sell whatever we have to make sure that uh, we continue through. Like failure was not an option. I know a lot of restaurants close, unfortunately, and obviously everyone have different circumstances. We have family to feed. Um, we, we don't have like uh, kids ourselves, both our partner and myself, and we're ready to go all in to for the projects at uh, any given time. So yeah, that's some that's a similar mentality that we have in this space. Where, where, did, yeah, you, where did you learn that relentless Mamba mentality? Because that is... I mean, the, the restaurant owners that do succeed are the ones that understand that as long as you don't give up, you'll win. Yeah. If I yeah, don't quit. 
I'll figure out a way to win. And I don't care yeah. if it's, we started as a breakfast restaurant and a sports bar, and now we're a barbecue media company. Like this is a 15 year journey for us. Like everything, it doesn't matter what it looks like in the beginning, as long as you're relentless and you will do whatever it takes. We had Matt yeah. Horn, chef Matt Horn, he has Horn Barbecue um, over in California. He's just opening up another spot, Bay Area down to Los Angeles. But he said, you know, one of the most important things for him was burning the boats. You know, if you don't burn the boats, then your, your, your risk tolerance is kind of your half in your half out. Like, no, you sold your house, you sold your car, you're yeah. all in, you're going to figure out how this thing's going to work. Yeah. I mean, I think I went through this with my partner way in the beginning. We didn't make money for the first three years. Uh, we had great feedback on Yelp. Customers love what were created. Uh, just to give a background, like hot pot was created when uh, there were only Asian customers eating hot pot. 95% uh, of customers didn't know, like a majority of America didn't know what hot pot is. And we, when we're open in Chicago or Denver, there's still a lot of people trying hot pot just like the first time they tried sushi, even today. Uh, but it's a different time. And even though we're getting all this great feedback, we weren't able to like generate, get to profitability. So we weren't getting paid at all. Both of us didn't take salary. And uh, we went through those three years, uh, just working 80 hour work week for this restaurant, thinking of new ideas, thinking of how to generate, get to profitability. And we had investors that, you know, even fell out during that time, like, hey, how can you guys run a restaurant without profitability, but had all this great feedback. Um, but throughout all this, we didn't give up. We pivoted. We understood that we need to build two, three locations to scale, uh, how to adjust payroll costs, things that we had no idea. We what year was that? What years, what years did you go from this one was restaurant? 2000. Yeah, this is 2013 to 2016, where we weren't profitable, but we realized like the product is great. And that's why I tell people like when you create the when you create a restaurant brand or any product, you want to make sure the customer is your first priority. So we created something that people love. We just didn't know how to get to profitability. Uh, fortunately, there was space like we, were, we understood like we have to sign better leases. We have to sign um, making sure that the payroll structure is we're not you were using payroll efficiently, right? All of our staff efficiently. How to, how to get there, uh, how to reduce our food costs. By now, we own our own cattle ranch in Oregon to improve the quality of our Wagyu and also at the same time to be, be able to control our logistic and food costs. So all those things we've learned throughout the way during this journey. But uh, yeah, the, the mentality of not giving up from the beginning, like we didn't generate <laughs> profit at all. So how, yeah. How do you buy a cattle ranch? Oh, so now we have a cattle, we work with Masami. <laughs> Uh, they, they have all their Wagyu cattle. So we take our cattle from Japan and mix it with American Wagyu. So it's called half blow Wagyu. And we end up having a partnership with them and we basically pay all the costs of feeding the cattle. We subscribe to like 150 cattle at a time, uh, and take, you know, take care of all the butcher costs, the feeding costs, uh, and everything else. So in a way you're buying like option contracts on or futures on Wagyu or whatever food costs. And we're able to do that because we have 10 locations that all sell Wagyu only. So everything above USDA, Prime or Angus on high quality ingredients. Yeah, that's incredible. How, how, does, uh, how does a restaurant group partner with the Venetian? Yeah, oh, funny story. So when th well, this is when we had 2016, uh, when we had three locations for Denver, Philly and, and um, Vegas for Chubby Cattle. And it's all uh, family friendly, like $40 per person, casual dining, right? Uh, and then the Venetian reached out to us saying that, hey, we want to partner with you and provide tenant incentive. At, the, at that time, I had no idea what that even is because we have we had to pay landlords to be like, <laughs> trust these 21-year-olds to open a restaurant yes. uh, in your space, right? And at, it's just a whole different transformation when we start working with corporate and public company, public landlords, companies, landlords that are basically publicly listed. They have the capital. They understand they're investing into a restaurant. Uh, and the Venetian, uh, was called, that's actually Brookfield Properties. They said, hey, we'll give you, which 10 incentive is you get uh, allowance. They give you a check to uh, subsidize part of your construction costs, right? So completely from like key money, which is when you start off uh, in the restaurant space, you have to pay the landlord a key money to even get the space because they don't yeah. trust you for running it. So we went from the worst side of the uh, of a potential commercial lease deal to the best uh, of getting a really good TI deal. And but it's also a learning process. Like they set up a percentage rent function in there, so which means the landlord landlord will get a percentage rent on top of what you generate in sales. Yeah. And now we've realized, like, wow, like this is a great deal. For 
the landlord because they, <laughs> they understood. Yeah, they understood like this is going to be a huge success the way that yes. we didn't even understand. Uh, and we put up a break even line to like $8 million a year, but we're doing like 20 million a year now. So oh they're making gosh. $20 million a, a year at this restaurant. Yeah. 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 So they're That's like, amazing. They, yeah. So <laughs> we realized, wow, this TI money and this percentage rent function, like it's great for the landlord when we do well. So, uh, we've learned a lot through that process and that's how we got into, uh, with working with Brookfield. Now we work with Prudentials, our landlord in Chicago, same, we have huge TI deals. And every new location we're getting into, we're getting landlords that's essentially your partner and not your vendor. So what that means is you're, they're not, they want you to be successful, right? If your restaurant does a great number of sales, they will have percentage rent function uh, at certain amount of sales. So we want landlords that are backing us uh, during the tough times and get great uh, reward at great times. So that's what we found to be the most successful projects is when we have landlords that are like our partners not just a vendor that's just wanting that minimum rent pay base base minimum rent. Yeah. That's a huge, that's a huge lesson that you've learned. And we have a lot of uh, restaurant owners from all over the world. We're fortunate the show's reached millions of people. Uh, can you talk to the restaurant owners that are out there? Because these are the ones, like we said, that are playing the game within the game. They're tired of working inside of their restaurant. They're ready to work outside of their restaurant, start to do bigger deals. How do you position yourself and your brand so that companies, bigger companies, bigger landlords want to partner with you. I mean, we're fortunate that we spent, we did such a good job serving barbecue, serving our community, providing hospitality that when they opened up the new stadium in San Diego at Snapdragon Stadium, they reached out to us. We were one of the eight restaurants out of 2000 restaurants in San Diego that got asked to be a part of this stadium. And for us, that's a huge deal. What would, what would your, what, thank you. What, what would your advice be to anybody that's listening to this show that's ready to, to up their game, get to the next level? Yeah. So as a restaurant operator, you have to, again, create brands and concepts that really attract and they will, it will be a benefit for the landlord to be like, hey, you are a destination based concept. You're not just a concept that because there's a lot of walk in traffic that you would do well in, right? Like you're not a concept that's going to do well in the airport because the location itself. So create a concept, whether it's fast casual, whether it's fine dining that has to draw people like there's value in your brand and that's so undervalued. So people don't understand that the brand is key. So if you, in the beginning, it might take you two to three locations to get there where the landlord will be like, Hey, I see that it's doing well in these couple locations. Uh, we want to invite you out. So that for us, like all the, now we don't really reach out to locations. We're waiting for landlords for this, this type of partnership. We're not searching for locations uh, and asking like, Hey, can we be in your space? But in order to do that, you do have to, get through the beginning first two, three years of building the first concept to show the proof of concept. Um, so I think that's key. And what about when you're launching a new concept? So once you've built the foundation, you have a, a money maker. why not make more money makers? Why branch off and start something? Why diversify? Um, well, I think, I think for us, we want to target different type of demographics for the expod. You're talking about $150 a person at Average then, uh, and we have chubby cattle that's like fifty dollars. Uh, we have Niku X that's two hundred fifty dollars per person. We want to make sure that all everyone in our community can try the different tiers, just similar to like why there's Lexus and Toyota. Uh, the different brands will attract a different clientele, and I think we have something to offer for everyone. Uh, but we understand the pricing couldn't like we can't put Wagyu. Um, we, in order to, we have to run a profitable business at the same time. We want to, we want to entertain everyone. We want to make sure everyone gets to try our creation. So we created these different brands and different concepts that uh, allow everyone uh, to try uh, the contemporary Asian cuisine, the barbecue and, and hot pot. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. 
keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. So you're somebody that cares not only about your personal brand, but you care about content. You have your own YouTube page. You have your own TikTok channel. You're crushing it on Instagram. You keep diving into different platforms of what we call smartphone storytelling. Why is it so important for someone that's as busy as you not to outsource all of that work? And I understand you have a whole team that helps you do what you do the same way that I finally now have a team, but I can still take my phone out of my pocket and communicate our brand message with the entire world. Why is it important to do that? Yeah. From the, on the business side, I think it's great for your ventures uh, to have a business telling right for you're just the business itself so every single one of our venture has their own instagram TikTok, and it tells a story from the business side for my personal page it's about actually a huge component of it is a long-term gain uh if you're talking about monthly l like monthly pnl i'm like negative for the social media game <laughs> since the beginning i'm not an influencer that's like making money on product deals people with dm like hey can you promote like i would never go to a restaurant and be like Hey, I want a free meal at this point. Like I, like I, I will promote my friends' restaurants. I will promote something that's good. It's yes. negative. Like I'm losing a couple thousand dollars a month, just yes. like having someone uh, shoot the content and edit, but it's a long-term game. I think I want to give back in a way. I want to share the story about entrepreneurship. I want to also, a lot of my followers are people that, that have come to my restaurant and supported my restaurants. So I want to give back in from my page uh, as well and talk about entrepreneurship and talk about the difficulties, just like in your show, the challenges that entrepreneurs face. That's something that I'm very big about and also give it advice and feedback. So I get a lot of DMs about, hey, I'm opening this food and beverage shop or this is my product. I would love to potentially get investors or resources. So that's something that I give back from there. But for myself, I want to create the content so I can show my grandkids or my kids down the line, right? That's the perspective I give. And, uh, and as, if I can help one person uh, that they can feel that they understand what I'm talking about and they can learn something from what I'm providing, that's a, a win for me. And I get a lot of these messages uh, that's very supportive of, of that content. I don't reach a huge mass of people, right? Because not everyone's into entrepreneurship or not everyone's into, it's not a funny TikTok or something that's very easily enjoyed. <laughs> you don't dance on TikTok? I don't dance, you know, but <laughs> it's it's for people that are, you know, wanting to learn, for people that are in the space that understands and they really get value out of it. And that's, that what, that's what makes me happy. I don't make any money selling courses or I don't make any money trying to you know push product or anything like that uh, i get offers for that but i would never like it's just the wrong for me to do that so 110 percent of my income come from like my restaurant stuff like the negative 10 sure. percent come from the social media stuff but i still do it because it's a passion and it's like oh, well, in, it, in my way of giving back yeah it's not only a passion but it also keeps you top of mind you know, yeah. when you're when we think that the people that work at the Venetian, the people that are landlords, the people in finance, the people that could be potential investors, if we don't think that they're on all of these platforms looking, they're probably not posting, but they're probably looking. So when they go to look you up and they see who you are and they get a, a chance to find out what's your frequency, then they know who you are. You know, it's like if you're not posting, then it's what what are you doing? Yeah, well. You know what? Absolutely. You know, so I, I guess you're, there's a lot of non-direct value coming from the content and social media page. I've you know gotten connected with investors, landlords, influencers, customers for the brand. Yeah. So when you put it in that way, that brings a lot of value to my ventures. Uh, it doesn't go to my personal pocket month to month when you see <laughs> yes. directly, right? Like in, like tic, TikTok or Instagram is not paying me you know tens of <laughs> or millions of thousands of dollars. <laughs> right to to make up for that or i'm not taking up brand sponsorships for the content like other influencers would but in terms of the business side yeah you're right it brings a lot of investors potential investors landlords 
brokers, vendors I mean, that, you know, all the time reach out. Absolutely. Your yeah. online content got you a brand sponsorship with the Venetian because they were looking at your online pro like all of the things that you learned in your early days of helping those other restaurants helped position you to absolutely. be in the right place for them to make that reverse, that reverse ask. You know, we absolutely. talk about the reverse funnel all the time. And the reverse funnel is you put out who you are and what you're building to the world. And if your frequency is where it needs to be and people connect, you'll find the right people. The best people that work for me at Cali Barbecue Media, my entire team, they found through content, whether it was audio, video, words, or images. It doesn't matter what the platform is. You know, we discriminate. We go, oh, Facebook. And then we think like, oh, that's meta. I don't like Facebook or TikTok. I don't like it because it's young and it's dancing. Snapchat. Don't. Just remove the logo. All it is is storytelling. Yeah. Literally, all we're talking about is storytelling. I agree. I, I think everyone in every industry, not just the food and beverage, should should create content. And uh, whether you're an accountant, you can create content around yes. con like this is a content economy for sure. And you will get you're right. You will get leads or benefits in ways that you can't. It's not like a normal funnel where you're like, I'm trying to get customers. I'm trying to get investors. I'm looking for specific conversions. In this way, you put out your content and certain people will find you, whether it's an investor or customer customer or uh, someone you can partner with. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's so important to have that storytelling. Yeah. Who, who do you look up to? Who are your mentors? And do you have a lesson or a story you can share that you, you've learned from them? Yeah, uh, I think my mentors have to be the people I work with day to day. I'm just, I just learned so much from my team. I know it's like not the usual mentor that you get as an answer. Maybe people like look up to Elon Musk or Gary Vee, who I you know, respect and I watch their content and I can respect a lot of other food and beverage. Uh, for example, like the uh, Panda Express owners, like what they've gone through, and I see a lot of similarities. But I, on a day-to-day -day basis, someone that guide me are definitely the team members. I learn a lot from our GMs. I learn a lot from my partner. Uh, I learn a lot from every the day-to-day -day people that work with me. So where I've learned most of the stuff is from uh, just the 10 years of working every day. Uh, the brokers we work with, the attorney we work with, the PR team we work with, and I just get so much information and knowledge from every conversation I have with all of them and the experiences I get from all of them. Um, and that's where I do all my learning. Yeah. So one of the most difficult lessons that I learned in the hospitality business is that as a leader, as a man, it's, uh, you know, we're in a business of taking care of people. So we take care of our community. We take care of our village. We take care of our team. Very rarely do we take care of ourselves. What do you do for yourself? Yeah, uh, I think balance is important. Absolutely, you got to take care of yourself mentally, physically, or else you get burnout. If it wasn't for a, like, I still, I, you know, I hit the gym, I do things I enjoy in my life, besides working 80 hours, work weeks, to make sure that you're in that physical, mental peak to be able to make all these decisions. Because at the end of the day, I think my job uh, for what I'm doing every day is just making the right decisions, making those few decisions every day that uh, end up to be great decisions for the company and for our team. So doing that uh, alongside with making sure you're fit, uh, it's so important. Like keeping your physical health and everything is so important. So I balance it out. I make sure that I'm working out. I'm also working uh, and also enjoying life. So uh, I, I got to say the part of my work is really fun because I get to, my job is like, I actually don't run the restaurant operation day to day. I have my partner that understands all the kitchen side and great GMs on all these locations to so manage the front of the house, which is uh, right the front of the house, not the kitchen side. Right. Uh, and I get to go in and get the customer experience to get feedback on customer experience when the finances and find partnerships, work with influencers, do the marketing. So I, I definitely have, I guess the more, uh, creative and fun side of things on a day-to-day -day basis. So I get to enjoy. So the work itself is very enjoyable uh, compared to, let's say you have to do more uh, repetitive work. Uh, for me, it's more of developing new locations and checking up on the quality of every single restaurant location. And I get to travel a lot and also do market research to see what's the newest, coolest thing in terms of other concepts or technology that we can use. So I'm always learning and learning is key so that you don't feel burned out uh, doing the same thing. Yeah. When, when are you in the zone? Oh, when I'm in the zone, uh, like a time timeline, yeah. like time data in a like day. Like doing what? What are you doing when you're in the zone? Oh, like I'm, actually, uh, majority of my time I'm spent on my computer. Like, yeah. unfortunately, it's just a lot of back office work uh, and uh, probably two, three hundred emails a day. 
uh, and then two, 300 messages on all the different platforms from team. So on your, on, you do this on your phone or on your computer? Oh, computer. Yeah. I'm a full workstation. So when okay. people think I'm working in a restaurant space, I'm like, I just get <laughs> hundreds of people looking for things, vendors, landlords, brokers, right? New development. And I'm dealing with all of these things uh, on a day to day. Yeah. So uh, every single week on Wednesday and Friday, we uh, we host a show on the Clubhouse app. Um, it's a digital hospitality show, but 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And it's an opportunity for people that listen to this show. You know, my grandfather taught us stay curious, get involved, ask for help. So if you're listening to a podcast, you're curious, but then you actually have to do some work. So this clubhouse allows you to raise your hand, get up on stage, tell your story. And I like to give people shout outs for people that are doing the work. And this this week's shout out goes to Giuliano. And that's 303 in the cut. So follow 303 in the cut. It's a food truck, gourmet food in Vegas. He does late night gourmet. The guy is absolutely crushing it, telling his story every single day on TikTok and Instagram. Couldn't be more proud of the work that he does. But David, I wanted to give you a chance. Um, this is entrepreneur. You get to shout out somebody on your team, um, somebody that's gone above and beyond, somebody that gets a little bit of extra recognition. Who do you got to shout out today? Yeah, uh, it's hard to pick one person. But I, now you got to do say, it. I'm singling you, know, you out now. <laughs> I mean, I mentioned my partner a lot. So obviously, it's important. But I do want to mention Joyce. Joyce is absolute is essential. He, she's a COO of our team. She's been keeping all of our team members together, uh, making sure all the operations run smoothly for the past nine years. And yeah, I got to give a shout out to Joyce. Uh, and she's also working on um, uh, all the all the locations and making sure. And that's so difficult. It's like you're dealing. I think the hardest part of food and beverage is that you're dealing with people and people are very it's not like you're running a software and the code will run every day when you're dealing with people you have to understand their you know the day-to-day -day that they're going through their mentality all your staff might going through different things in life their satisfaction of work changes so you have to manage all of that uh and you have to be a great communicator you have to great be a great person people want to work like be an amazing person that people want to work with you respect and work with you on a day-to-day -day, even through the tough challenges um, I want to, you know, so shout out to that. And one more shout out, if I may, I want to shout yes. out to Chef Shin, uh, who's made a huge move from Chicago and, and became a partner of ours. And we're opening up Niku X in Los Angeles, which will be a the first of its kind contemporary Japanese barbecue. Uh, yaki Wait. Niku. Really? Uh, it'll be like, yeah, it'll be the first. When's that opening? That in two weeks. We're opening no in two way. weeks. Amazing. And it's, and it's in the Intercontinental Hotel in, in, in downtown LA. So the tallest building, and we're trying to take Japanese barbecue to the next level with our Michelin chef, uh, Chef Shin wow. Thompson. And it's going to be something. So when you're when you're in LA, I'd love to host you. Oh, we're and, coming. And we're you. coming for yeah. sure. Absolutely, yeah. we're going to get some behind the scenes footage for sure. Absolutely, yeah. So it's been a it's been a pleasure working with Shin and his Chef Shin and his team, uh, and really curate this uh, next level uh, Japanese barbecue experience. That's incredible. So if you guys, uh, if you guys want to reach out to me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. We love to hear from you, hear about what you're building, how we can help, help you out. Um, David, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, like you said, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok. It's the way. I feel free to shoot me a message. I've tried to answer to everyone. That's at it's the way. Yeah. yeah. I-T-S-D-A. W E I crushing it on Instagram, crushing it on TikTok. has a YouTube page. Dude, David, I love the, the work that you're putting out. And I feel like you're, uh, <laughs> you're only getting, you're only getting started. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. I, I, to the same to both of us, you know, we're just hustling yeah. and, and building content and, and loving the work we do. Yeah, absolutely. Building content, building community. We couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you for listening to the show. Um, please subscribe. Please tell a friend. Please go visit David's restaurants. If you're in the area, um, reach out, tag him on social. Let him know that you uh, you appreciate his, his wisdom that he shared with us on his journey. And uh, we can't wait to see what you build next. We're definitely coming to check out some Japanese barbecue in LA, though. I, I promise you that. And when you Absolutely. when you make it when you make it down to San Diego, let me know. I'll uh, I'll give you a tour of Cali Barbecue and the Smokehouse. And that goes for anybody listening to the show. You guys are all VIPs in our book. So thank you for listening. We're we're grateful.
And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poon Kinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S H A W N P W A L C H E F. I will get you the link to the right Toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show, that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about Toast, you implemented Toast, you did a Toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your Toast story with us. DM me today to learn more. Be sure to check out Toast.